Hey guys, welcome to my podcast. Um, Today we have the one and only Matt Berkey. He has 4.6 million caches. He's the founder of Solve for Why, the host of Only Friends, uh, and also a regular in the high stakes cash game scene. How are you doing today? I'm great. Good. Um, So I guess first things first, let's kick it off with a spicy topic. I'm a little checked out of the poker scene. Where are we at with the Robbie Garrett Jack 4 drama? Uh, I don't think you are missing much. It's it's pretty inconclusive. I think it's still just a scenario where everybody suspects something happened in the hand. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows if any cheating actually occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, but the hand itself is kind of the closest thing we have to a smoking gun. Yeah. Uh, since then, there's just been you know a lot of, I guess, uh, drama. <laughs> For lack of a better word. I've been seeing a lot of finger pointing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't think we can ever conclusively find out. Uh, I don't I don't want to get into all mm-hmm. the back and forth. But sure, uh, when it's all said and done, Hustler is ran by people who are heavily incentivized to not really discover much. And they don't. Yeah. They're not overseen by anybody. Right. Yeah. So it's not like Poker Go where, yeah. you know, Maury has to answer to Carrie and. Uh, executives at CBS and and things like that. It's, it literally the buck stops with the producer of the show himself. Yeah. So um, I don't think anything's ever going to come of it. It's very yeah. unfortunate, kind of a black stain. But um, to kind of put you on the spot, if you had to assign a percentage to the likelihood that Robbie cheated in the hand, mm-hmm. what would you what would you say? I I'm still over fifty percent, mm-hmm. just because if nothing else, I'm highly highly confident that her and rip were Mm. at a minimum soft playing um sure but soft playing isn't like soft playing isn't cheating right well it is okay i mean you know (laughs) it's not it's not cheating as the same as it would be if you were rubbernecking looking at someone's cards or uh if you had perfect information Uh but yeah we don't know we don't know what that extrapolates out to like just because we saw them uh, play certain hands certain ways against each other. If there's somebody in the middle, they're stealing EV from that person. No, you're right? right. So like, yeah. it, it is a form of soft cheating, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, that coupled with how unbelievable the hand is, mm-hmm. it leans me like 55, 45, 60, 40, somewhere in that mm-hmm. neighborhood. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, it's just very difficult to get the proper evidence. Yeah, no, okay. So, okay. Yeah, that's super fair. Um, I think... My comment about soft playing not being cheating is just because, like, similar to yourself, I've just played in so many high six games where yeah. you have, like, whales who are soft playing each other and they're just, like, nothing. Like, you can't do anything. Yeah, when, when two losing so. <laughs> players are checking down against each other, <laughs> nobody like, cares. Of like, course. okay, I guess, like, have fun. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and I would never speak up. But it, it does seem like, from the few people I've talked to, most people think that she, like, probably cheated. Um, I guess it's cool to me to see people get like less confident as time goes on because yeah. like in the first 12 hours it seemed like no one knew what 100 percent meant yeah no i think that's <laughs> that's been the the ongoing theme is yeah. uh people are learning to think probabilistic a little bit more yeah uh, i mean i i feel like the only time i was extreme with my my vantage point mm-hmm. was within the first few hours mm-hmm. like when i first saw it i was like 99 percent nothing this is a nothing burger and then That's what I thought too. as like a little bit of time passed mm-hmm. and I kind of registered a little bit more what was going on, I was like, okay, now I think it's like 99% yeah. likely something happened. Yeah. And then, you know, you just kind of just regress to the mean from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I, I don't think I was ever that extreme either way. I think for me, like when I saw so many p- people say like, oh, like it's like 90% or like 100% that she cheated. It's like, no, like let me tell you how this hand could have happened otherwise. Yeah. Because I've made some like, let's just call them frisky raises and then like fuck you spike calls. So if I can do it, like I assume other people can as yeah, well. Yeah, I saw a lot of that commentary kind of floating around and I, I kind of struggle with that because like mm-hmm. so, I, I mean, we've all punted. We've all done crazy, yeah. crazy inconceivable things sure. but this hand breaks those those rules right like in what ways it never it was never generated from a frame of logic like no matter how punty a play may be uh we we generally will at least start with a purpose right mm-hmm. so like if we're raising for instance to bluff mm-hmm. uh with nine high and then we get shoved on and there's a a deep-seated part of us that hates money so much that we're like hey 
I just really don't think he has it. We still arrive at the fact of like, oh, right, but I don't have it either, right? Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely been spots where I've raised a little bluff, and by the end of my five-minute tank, I've come up with the one hand that I now beat, and I've somehow clicked the call yeah, button. Yeah, same. Because you don't win the pot when you fold. I don't know if you know this. No, no, no. <laughs> I, look, I'm on board with you, and I've done the same, but it's it's with yeah. hands that like— That makes sense. Well, they, they beat something. You can find the one hand they beat. They're ace high. They're they're a pair. They're something along those lines where you can logically at least look at the hand ranking chart and say like, oh, okay, this yeah. is at least a pip or two above something. Yeah. It seemed like so the board was 10-9-3. What was the board? Something like that. 10-9-3-5, uh, I believe, or 10-9-5-3, okay. something so like it that. It seemed like she like beat like a lot of straight draws. Um, I mean, she loses to a lot of straight draws. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> she just loses to Queen Jack of Hearts. Uh, but moving on from this, so you've been around in the high six scene for a while, um, and I don't actually know if I like know how you kind of got your starts playing bigger. Mm. Um, it was 2013. I was coming off of being broke for what I hoped was the last time. Uh, I had a big summer at the World Series. Ended up making three final tables, cash for like a half a million, mm -hmm. and I had roughly half of myself. Um, it's like yeah, so it was I, a year prior. I had three hundred thousand. I torched it. I had zero mm -hmm. coming into the start of that year, and ended up finding a way back. But in the meantime, I uh, had been playing with Bob Bright for three or four years, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he just really enjoys playing cards. He doesn't yeah. really care about the stakes. Yeah. Uh, he enjoys the pain, mm -hmm. and he enjoys inflicting the oh, pain. He really enjoys. Yeah. There was a time, so I was on a short leash for the Jeremy game. Um, I sold most of my action, but uh, I, I think I ran like an over pair into his quads. And right before turning over his cards, he says two pair. Yeah, he like, loves this joke. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, like, two pair would have beat me anyway, right, so it didn't matter. Yeah. No, he really enjoys, like him announcing two pair is bad, bad news for but you. But I had like, I was on a five buy and leash the entire time I was playing Jeremy's mm. game. So like terrifying hand all around yeah I, I can definitely relate I think I played that game for seven years never having more than like 15 buy-ins yeah. available <laughs> so it's, it's definitely uh it's it's tough to navigate the high stakes world for sure um but anyway he he enjoyed my action he was always uh basically dangling the carrot on the string in front of me <laughs> knowing that like I'm pretty broke yeah. And, you know, I'm grinding like these 5-10 games that he comes and plays. He's like, oh, we played this bigger game at Aria. You're always welcome to come sit. <laughs> it's like, thanks, Bob. I would love to. And I was like very yeah. egotistical too. Like I, sure. I didn't want to admit that I was broke. Mm. So I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, sometime, someday. Uh, and then I had a big summer and he was like, you know, we still have those seats. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'll take you up on that if, you, yeah. if you're being genuine. Mm. Um, so he got me in. First, the first time I played was something out of a nightmare mm -hmm. it was a six-handed game the game was like super soft it was uh people who weren't even really regs it was like bob jrb um and then a handful of others that mm -hmm. just kind of dabble alan richardson being one of them you say this but like i don't this to me does not sound like a soft game and this perhaps like speaks more to the disparity in like our skill level mm. but i do not look at like bob wright jrb and like alan richardson and think like oh wow that's an incredible game i mean i was 33 at the time and the youngest player at the table by like 10 years sure but if anything what that means is these people have all been able to either make a living playing poker or afford playing poker for de like yeah the latter <laughs> i mean that's why we're here it's <laughs> literally why we're here but uh richardson walks in with lisa hamilton who i had known for a very long time mm -hmm. and he sees me sitting there and he's like who's this I'm like, hi, Matt, Lisa, how's it going? Did he interrogate people even back then? Oh, God, yeah. He's, he's been... <laughs> the funny thing is, too, it's like, JRB had no idea who I was. He, I was yeah. I was sold to him as like a 2-5 kid, sure. which wasn't that far off from the truth. Yeah. Uh, and he had probably known Richardson for half a decade at that point. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, shut up, Alan. <laughs> No, JRB and Alan have such different ways of vetting people. Like, yeah. whenever anyone new comes in, like, Alan asks them, like, 
what's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? Do you have a business card? Yeah, like, yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah, he came back in like 20 <laughs> minutes later and gave a printed out copy of my Hendon mod <laughs> to Jeremy, which also wasn't impressive <laughs> at That's all. That's incredible. Uh, and Jeremy was just like cracking jokes about it. Um, <laughs> but then on top of that, uh, we're like halfway through the session and to 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 tell you like how different this game was and like how quote unquote elderly it was mm -hmm. we literally broke like three hours in to go get dinner like w they didn't have food delivered everybody just was like hey let's that. let's all go to john george <laughs> yeah so we're getting ready to leave and i'm walking out and i have my mm -hmm. book bag with me and at the time i was just a grinder like i was used to bringing my own food yeah and i packed the thermos full of homemade chili <laughs> and for whatever reason i must have like packed it too hot uh-huh and the the seal <laughs> The seal must have like broke from the steam oh, and it just no. explodes in my book bag. Like sounds like a bomb going off. <laughs> I'm mortified. Sure. Like it sounds like it sounds like, you know, I'm I'm basically trying to take the aria down. They're <laughs> ready to call security on me. And Jeremy looks at me and goes, What the fuck was that? I'm like In case I lost. <laughs> I'm like, I I have chili in my book bag and yeah. it it exploded. Oh. <laughs> it's like you don't need to bring food. I'm like, I understand that now. <laughs> I'm just trying to fit in, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, we were playing 200, 400. Then within mm -hmm. a couple of weeks, it turned to 3, 6, 12. And I was lucky enough to find backing and stick yeah. around for a better part of a decade. That's awesome. Um, so what was the biggest you had played prior to? 2550. Wow. That's yeah. a nice 8X increase in stakes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and I had a lot of myself in that first 2, 4 game. I think I had like 70%. Mm -hmm. um, I was just firing. But <laughs> oh no i've yeah yeah you understand <laughs> i've been there um one of the things i actually want to talk to you about so i was going to ask if you've ever felt the way i felt where i was playing a game that started off as quarter 50 mm -hmm. i come back from a like two week long vacation it's now playing 200 400 i have 100k to my name and it's just like i sell half I take 50% of myself and it's like, fuck it. Like I'm going for it. Had I not won that session, we probably would not be here now. Like they yeah. would not have seen me again. Um, yeah. I didn't have it to that degree because mm -hmm. uh, when I was your age, you know, 5'10 uncapped was big mm -hmm. and I was dealing with way less than 100K. Uh, I didn't have my first 100K roll until I was like 28, I think, mm -hmm. 29 maybe. Um, but I had a lot of like 50K rolls along the way that I torched basically doing exactly what yeah. you're describing. Uh what, the 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 funny thing of of risk of ruin mm -hmm. is that we as humans don't really understand how numbers compound, and if you are taking on like twenty five percent risk of ruin once, that's oh, fine. Yeah. You're, you're probably fine. You know, yeah. seventy five percent of the time you're going to make it. For sure. But if you just do it every time you yeah. sit down, eventually it catches up, and it's inevitable that you're just going to go broke. And I learned that kind of the hard way, I would say. Same. Um, but. You know, when you're young, you should yeah. do that. I think so too. Yeah, I, I think you can afford to be super risk on because you don't have any obligations and. Oh yeah, also yeah. It like forces you to figure out if this is actually what you want to pursue. Like, yeah. you don't just find success in some sort of career path because you get lucky enough to be good <laughs> at it and suffer no negative variance and yeah. like have all the doors open for you, whatever, like you'll just grow so bored of that. Yeah. Right. You kind of have to struggle through something mm -hmm. and prove to yourself like this is actually worth pursuing. Did you ever come close to quitting poker? Oh, yeah. Um, I came close to not even starting, I guess. Uh, when I graduated college, I was still trying to get signed in baseball. Like that was my mm -hmm. number one pursuit uh, in spite of the fact that like I definitely was not talented enough. <laughs> Uh, I just wasn't ready to accept that. And poker was nice because it was facilitating me traveling all over the Midwest, going to these tryouts, making a few thousand along the way, whatever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I come from a very impoverished area that making 30,000 a year is like kind of doing well for yourself. Yeah. And I have this comp side degree and I think I've, I felt like I had these high expectations to kind mm -hmm. of be more than somebody who yeah. just works construction or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when push came to shove and my friend Brian was kind of like, look, I'm doing this, I'm all in. And I think you're better than I am. You should pursue it too. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, Hey man, I made like, you know, $15,000. That's more money than I've ever seen in my life. Like yeah. maybe I'll just use this to start something more normal. And he's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, 
I don't know, yeah. <laughs> not work. That's for sure. Uh, so I think that was kind of like the ultimate selling point. But mm -hmm. the closest I was to quitting was uh, 2010. I went deep in the main event, mm -hmm. uh, had like a 200K score. And over the next 18 months or so, I ran it up to like 350-ish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like any young entrepreneur, you want to make money passively. So I started a stable. Oh, no. So I did not? the exact same thing as yeah. you know. Well, what else are you going to do? You're not good at anything else. <laughs> yeah. So you think you can like kind of transfer these skills onto other people and yeah. show them the way. But that failed. Mm -hmm. We all went on a downswing together. They lost collectively like 200 playing yeah. 510. And yeah. I was playing like 2550 and went broke. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from like all of, for all of 2012 and then into early 2013, mm -hmm. I was just like kind of waking up taking a nap immediately after oh, getting out of yeah. bed, <laughs> trying to figure out like what the hell I was going to do with my life. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't even know what I want to say it worked out, but, uh, you know, do basically you have any lessons that you can take away from that period of time. I don't know if lessons is the right way to look at it, but it forced, uh, it forced a path of self-actualization that probably should have started slightly younger maybe maybe that's unfair to myself like i don't know mm -hmm. 29 seems like a good time to figure out who the fuck you are and what you want to do with yourself mm -hmm. um but like you know it removed money completely yeah because it's easy when you're young to get blinded by chasing riches yeah. and the idea of having like a secure life and independence forever yeah. off of you know a good couple of years sure. um when that got removed now it became a matter of like okay well you're gonna survive like yeah you're not going to die. Mm -hmm. You're still intelligent enough to like yeah. figure out a way to 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 make it. Mm -hmm. um, but what does making it actually mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I spent like the better part of that year just kind of really traversing a lot of uh, introspection. And uh, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to, uh, <laughs> which was very humbling considering I was dead broke at the time. But uh, I was asked to go back to my high school and speak, mm -hmm. do a... Um, keynote speech yeah. on a non-traditional career path. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of framed it around Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because like, you know, I come from the steel mill town where it's very small and it's not, I don't want to say it's impoverished, but like we're not killing it there. You yeah, know, I understand. Uh, the idea is to get out, not to, to stay there for life. Mm -hmm. And everybody tries to follow that traditional path. It was mm -hmm. beaten to you as a kid, like go to school. Yeah. Get a job or go to go to college, whatever. Sure. Pick a career, get married, have yeah. kids, die. Yeah. And I was like, well, I don't subscribe to that. Yeah. I want all. more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I kind of based it around this idea of like that line of thinking is the lower needs and the hierarchy of of just trying to find like security, shelter, clothing, mm -hmm. whatever. And then beyond that is a lot of enlightenment, like love for oneself, love for another, mm -hmm. uh, altruism. And I think that that year really helped frame what that looks like to me what the, the higher needs look like to me, like mm -hmm. what the pursuit of enlightenment and fulfillment look like. What does that look like? Um, Honestly, I think it's a little bit more cloudy to me now than it was then. At 30, you still are a little pie-eyed and, you know, the world is your oyster. Yeah. So I think then I was kind of framing it as I could be wildly impactful in the world some mm -hmm. way, somehow, like I want mm -hmm. to figure out a way to leverage whatever it is that I'm good at mm -hmm. to make a greater impact on society as a whole. Yeah. At 40, I think you kind of get beaten down a little <laughs> where <laughs> you realize scope and scale sure. is uh, very difficult to achieve mm -hmm. without either a lot of luck or a lot of attributes that set you apart yeah. from the, the rest of the world. I'm not, I don't know that I necessarily possess those. So I think now it's more so just my inner circle Mm -hmm. uh, people within arm's reach, like having yeah. some sort of great impact there. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I think, I think I've always viewed the world as like from a place of, I think I can potentially make a small or even large difference in a few people's lives. I'm less confident in my ability to make a difference in like many people's lives. Um, but a lot of what you said like really resonates with me where I think up until really this last year or two, like I was just like so focused on like making dollars. Mm. Uh, and then I realized like, okay, like I'm probably not going to be wildly wealthy in the next year or two. But 
also, like, all of my basic needs are provided for. So so now what do I want? Um, because kind of like you said, like, money isn't my end-all be-all. And uh, we've talked about, like, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like, a couple of years ago. And in the time since, I've definitely thought about what you said. And, yeah, like, there is more to life than just, like, making sure that you have, like, a food and perhaps like a nice shelter over your head yeah so. why do you why do you feel like uh you could make impact on few people's lives but not many honestly i don't even know if i'm like uh i think to me it just sounds like it's too much responsibility and ob- obligation hmm. um also there's something to be said about how it's like it's scary to try something and fail is, is oftentimes easier to not try at all um But I think like just because of like some childhood stuff, there was such a focus for me on survival rather than flourishing. So I feel like I need to be flourishing before I can think about like everything from a place of abundance and be like. I can relate to that somewhat. Uh, It's funny. This is the third time I've had this conversation of easier to not try at all than to try and fail like within the last 36 hours. (laughs) Um, I, my, my mind doesn't work that way at all. I'm yeah. quite the opposite. Like uh-huh. I relish failure. I think that like the effort that goes into failing yeah. is just worth so much. Like it, it, it's just yeah. so easy to build off of. Um, mm-hmm. but really like for me and the reason why I pose that question to you is because I don't mm-hmm. necessarily, I think you're selling yourself a little short. Um, because I think that when it comes to impact, it's, it's two major things that allow, you to have significant impact, whether it's on a small scale or a large scale. And it's simply motive. Uh, so like a strong urge or desire mm-hmm. to truly do things that impact the greater good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then secondarily, it's vision. And for me, like the motive's there. It's always been the way that I have mm-hmm. felt and lived. And, um, you know, going all the way back to being a kid, yeah. like I was raised in a community. So like I just feel that urge to build people up Mm -hmm. but i've never had strong vision when Mm -hmm. it comes to scaling it so like i'm not elon Mm -hmm. i don't i don't just like wake up one day and go i'm getting this (laughs) i'm getting this race to mars (laughs) like that's it yeah that's it today's the day like sure congratulations people in 20 years you're all coming to mars with me like i i don't i don't (laughs) I don't see right. it, you know, it's like, I don't yeah. know how to tackle homelessness or, or yeah. food insecurity or things like that. Yeah. Um, I definitely feel similarly with perhaps the caveat that like, I don't know, like my motivation certainly is not as strong as yours. Hmm. Um, I definitely possess like a l- few more lone wolf tendencies, although like as anyone who's interacted with me knows like I am so grateful to my network for just like for getting me to here because there are so many people I can kind of point to along the way um that have just helped me like so much yeah um and on that note like who would you say has like had the biggest positive impact on you and then separately your career um I mean, career is probably pretty shallow because, it, you know, Bright just offered me the biggest opportunity in the world. Like yeah. getting me in that game was just a game changer. I, I don't know where I would like to believe that I was still gotten to high stakes, but who mm-hmm. knows? Because without the opportunity to play, like I'm running into it now. Mm-hmm. If you don't have games, it doesn't matter how good you are. Yeah. Um, I probably would be a tournament pro now, which God bless everybody who's playing tournaments for a living. <laughs> sure. Uh, I don't have it in me. Um, life-wise, you, you know, it, nobody really stands out. It's funny, you kind of mentioned the lone wolf. I, I think that by default, that is my personality. It's like I gravitate towards a lot of self-trust and a lot of, mm-hmm. I don't want to say isolation necessarily, sure. but like I don't really put myself in a position to be led all that often. Mm. And it's not because I don't, desire it i guess mm-hmm. like it would be not i would love nothing more than somebody who's yeah. uh much more established and smarter than me to say like look these are the five things that you're fucking up and mm-hmm. you could do better with 
And uh, I think I just like cherry pick my network really well to try to entrust them mm -hmm. where like I can crowdsource that type of stuff amongst five or 10 people that mm -hmm. I trust implicitly mm. as opposed to like being fortunate enough to just have a mentor. Sure. Um, and maybe fortunate enough is not the right word. Like not everybody's built the same and yeah. the bias of, of listening to one single voice obviously is uh, not always best. Yeah. I, I don't, I've always been someone where like I prefer to triangulate amongst as many people as possible. Like, so I'll take an opinion from you and then I'll like check it against like four other people. And yeah. if everyone like roughly agrees that like maybe like what you recommended is if not best, like then second best. And she's like, OK, now I'll proceed. But I've always been a little bit, I think, cautious with just taking one person's advice and running with it. Yeah, I think my process is probably the exact opposite where I trust myself first mm -hmm. to act yeah and then I find my close inner circle and say like what are your thoughts on this mm. and it's like my trust for them is equally as high so if they immediately give me negative feedback and say like oh you fucked this up mm -hmm. then I just take it at face yeah yeah I like that um and to add on to that and to borrow an idea from Ray Dalio, I really like what he says about like judging people's credibility. But with that said, if it's like mostly life stuff and you've already just like pre-vetted these people, that's obviously ideal. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you, why solve for why? What was the impetus behind starting your company? Um, partly I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. Uh, if, yeah. if, for anybody who's not familiar, um, his most recent book is uh, Infinite Game, which I probably liked the most out of his entire series. But mm -hmm. his core his core idea was this idea of starting with why. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the idea of like the way that humans have evolved to problem solve was very hammer to nail, right? It was who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? But mm -hmm. we prioritize the what and how. So when it comes to the industrial revolution and everything there prior yeah. it was literally like what's the problem yeah. and how can i tackle it yeah and just get an immediate solution that's all yeah. that really matters we don't care about projecting for the future or building anything around it it's just you know solve this now yeah. but we're in a technological revolution we're at a point where society is starting to get you know pretty evolved mm -hmm. and enlightenment is closer now than it was yeah. ever anywhere along the trajectory so mm -hmm. The, the idea of purpose mm -hmm. rather than a goal uh, or uh, a purpose-driven um, purpose mindset, I guess, mm -hmm. always resonated with me. Sure. And I think that that's also like reflective in why I'm not wealthier. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like uh, if you don't really prioritize money and you just allow yeah. it to be a secondary element Absolutely. to your process, uh, you, you get whatever you need, but you don't necessarily accumulate more. Uh, so when I wanted to, I, I felt that there was a neat, good. Well, let's, no, let's calm down good. for a second. You're doing pretty well for yourself. Um, you live in a gorgeous yeah. house. You drive a beautiful car. You only fly JSX. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah but it, you <laughs> I know, don't know about the getting what you need. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. You're doing I, a touch better I, than I, that. I agree. I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely living in abundance, but yeah. you know, it's all very, very much fleeting. Like, the, we're, it's 2022. The the financial crisis is upon us. Everything's collapsing. <laughs> my house is for sale. My lease is up. Are you worried about getting fired anytime soon? No, but uh, <laughs> I'm worried that poker won't be a thing yeah. anytime soon. Um, it seems cyclical. Like it, it seems like there's ebbs and flows. But yeah, I, I mean, I look, we didn't pick the most secure life path here. And <laughs> you have the the benefit of being young and intelligent, where I'm old and withering. So. Uh, Let's also add in female because poker. It's <laughs> sure, but that's, my point is yeah. like if the rug gets pulled out from underneath you, yeah. you're going to be just fine. Mm, uh, that's fair. Figuring out like things I want to pivot into mm. at forty is a lot. Actually, you know what? It's not you're even pretty adaptable, and you're pretty resilient from everything I've seen. Maybe we'll we'll, we'll <laughs> see. Life will continue to test. Yeah, uh, it's easy when you're callous, like. Mm -hmm. You know, as a young person, when sure. you're used to having nothing and uh, you're you're pretty accustomed to being resilient because you have to be, mm -hmm. that becomes norm. But when sure. you start to live a cushy life and, you know, you get to go on snowboarding trips in the winter and things like that, now all of a sudden <sighs> your new normal, the floor sure. is higher, right? That's true. 
So uh, the notion that like we can't ever dip below our current floor is obviously flawed. Sure. And yeah. the more time that passes, like I don't have a 401k. Sure. You know, I'm trusting yeah. a digital coin to hold up. <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> it's asking a lot. Yeah, I've, I've bought up some more crypto, so. Yeah. Um, and I'm tired of buying crypto. So if Bitcoin could just please go up now, that would work perfectly. Yeah, I think we'd all be me. in a better place. Um, but yeah, no, to go back to kind of like why solve for why we got mm. a little bit sidetracked there. Uh, yeah. So I, I guess like um, when Christian and I were developing the company, the the idea behind it was in 2016, solvers were just becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, all of study that was available was just yeah. training videos, right? But it was mm -hmm. very heavily geared towards online players. Mm -hmm. And I think that became even more so true once solvers, uh, yeah. you know, became very popularized. So we saw this whole, I guess, in the live training space. And I didn't want to just, I, I didn't want to teach. Like that wasn't necessarily my motivation. Mm -hmm. It was more so that uh, I wanted to demonstrate that having um, a, a process oriented way or sure. approach yeah. would surpass a goal oriented one, right? So I wanted to take all the people who had been stuck at two five for the last yeah. half a decade, who's, quote unquote goal was to get to 510 or 1020 okay. and to make more money and all these other things and just like kind of demonstrate like you're going about this all wrong. There's a better process here. If you would just put emphasis on this aspect of study and this aspect of yeah. diligence and discipline and things yeah. of that nature, uh, it'll carry you to where you want to go. So uh, I really, I guess like I was younger too. So big picture, I thought that it could scale. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted poker just to be um, a launching pad of sorts mm -hmm. and a testing ground. I figured yeah. if I can find a way to establish myself in the industry that I know best, mm -hmm. which is super small and super niche, sure. um, but very much uh, highlighted by problem solving, mm -hmm. maybe this can expand into something larger. Maybe mm -hmm. this turns into a foundation. Maybe this turns into uh, something with a more grandiose purpose. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ensure that like the core value of it came from that uh, purpose-driven mindset to begin with. Do you feel like you guys have done a pretty good job of sticking to that like core mindset of being like process-oriented rather than goal-oriented? I think so, yes. Um, but the problem is that to run a profitable company, you have mm -hmm. to you have to sacrifice the grander vision a lot along the way. Um, like we're doing to well. a profitable company. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. If I wanted to, if I just wanted to burn dollars, uh, you it, can, yeah. it would be very easy for me to just kind of. Hold uh, on to your vision. Yeah. yeah, because I would be able to turn my attention elsewhere. Like I wouldn't have to spend so much time on the marketing. I wouldn't have to spend so much time on yeah. uh, overseeing the content and, mm. you know, basically being a CEO of this little tiny niche mm -hmm. company, but instead I could be doing business development for like the bigger picture type stuff that I, right. I think it was available for. Yeah. Just kind of, I don't know, at a crossroads, I suppose. Mm, I see. Um, what would you say is the worst recommendation you commonly hear from other poker coaches? Uh... Honestly, I, I know that this is not going to be a popular take, <laughs> but I think I think it's a disservice often to encourage oversimplification. Uh, the end, because really, what it does is it creates a a lifespan for players who have no business really pursuing this. And I think this notion that literally anybody like that poker is a learned skill that mm -hmm. anybody has the aptitude to take on and um, turn into profit mm -hmm. is misleading. Uh, on top of that, you know, you can only hack your way through yeah. a complex arena for mm -hmm. so long before it catches up with you. So I'd like to equate it to like, if you had, I think life coaches are bullshitty also, but imagine you hire a life coach or a psychiatrist yeah. or a, a psychologist or something like that. And you go, look, like my life's in shambles. I, I need I need help. I need yeah. to get myself back to at least being stable. And they go, okay, here's five simple tips and tricks. 
for you to get yourself back on level ground, right? Because sure. because poker is that complicated. Yeah. And we try to distill it down to these very simple metrics of bet, check, fold, um, range versus range, hand versus hand. We, we, we try to say like, here, let me spoon feed you mm -hmm. the skills necessary to start making profitable decisions. But then the player shows up in game and it's like somebody turns a fire hose on in their face. It's like, well, we didn't, we didn't talk about this. This guy's using seven different sizings mm -hmm. and, you know, he just relentlessly betting over and over and over again. We never prepared for this. And it's like, yeah, because the game's hard. Mm -hmm. I, I hear where you're coming from. And I think for myself, like I found it really helpful to be like, or to get spoon fed bite-sized pieces. Um, but then to also learn a bit about the theory at the same time until like eventually I start picking up on patterns myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I learned that way also. Mm -hmm. Your aptitude for this though is a thousand fold the average person off the street. Right. And you have to remember who our consumers are whenever they're, we're looking mm -hmm. at the training space. Sure. The average customer is going to be something like your uncle, you know, who is a poker enthusiast mm -hmm. and watches the World Series on TV. He doesn't have your aptitude to just instantly be able to draw sure. upon hundreds of hours of gameplay already, mm -hmm. all of the the online videos that you can see, not you specifically, but- So I can stop know. feeling personally attacked is what you're saying. Correct. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Uh, but, you know, like you're, you're well above average intellect. You're well above average with your social skills. You've put in time at the table. Like you're going to learn kinesthetically better mm -hmm. than people who don't have those attributes. It's This is no different than a sport, yeah, right? You can't take some slob off the street who's five foot eight and 200 pounds overweight that's and just right. say, hey, go be good at basketball. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a very good point. Um, and to this day, so anyone who ever like slides into my DMs asking for specifically advice, not hitting on me and not asking for backing, I almost always give the time of day to. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are like considering like becoming professional poker players. So oftentimes my first question for them is, or to them, uh, is like, what is your competitive advantage? What is going to make you better than everyone else who also wants to play poker for a living? And to this day, there are really only two answers that I find like satisfactory. The first one is I'm an incredible networker. And the second one is I will just outwork everyone. Um, and if their answer isn't one of those two, then it's like you should probably find a different job to pursue. Yeah. Uh, but let me kind of turn the question back on you. Like, what is your best piece of advice for other poker players? Um, that's a good question. I think, I think the best advice I can offer someone is to put a timeline on the pursuit. And I don't mean that in the sense of, um, of having to achieve X by Y date. Mm -hmm. I mean, more so put an expiring clock on yeah. how long you're willing to do this as your sole focus. Yeah. Um, because I think the most successful people in this industry are people who are at a point where they can divide their time yeah. and not solely rely on poker as their income, right? Like I, I would say to everybody who is a poker enthusiast or professional or anything in between, mm -hmm that this game is one of the greatest teachers mm -hmm. for life lessons. Sure. And it's a fantastic way to make some income, mm -hmm. but it's almost impossible moving forward for it to be your sole source of income for the entirety of your life. Okay. Yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Um, what makes you say that you feel like p the people that are most successful do not rely on poker as their sole source of income? Uh, because of how capped it is the, okay. like, as you rise to high stakes, yeah. a few things tend to happen. Uh -huh. One availability to play goes mm -hmm. way, way down. Right. And with that goes your volume and your hours spent. Mm -hmm. Um, and then two, your earn goes way, way, way up. Mm -hmm. Right. So your hourly yeah. is through the roof, but your ability to put in hours is yeah. relatively low. Yeah. And you just start to take advantage of all that recoup time mm -hmm. and now this baseline that you've created for what your time is worth. Yeah. And you just start to pursue avenues mm -hmm. that um, 
can have comparable returns, even if they're steep learning curves, mm -hmm. right? Because you have the time and energy to try and fail. Sure. You already have success elsewhere that you can kind of fall back on. Yeah, that, that's an that's an excellent point. And in my experience, I have found that people who are successful at poker just like pursued it wholeheartedly. And, yeah. and I feel like you you have to. Um, so I do think it's important that for anyone listening, like if you want to make it as a professional poker player, you should keep your costs to an absolute minimum. You should be willing to invest in coaching. Um, and you should just like live, breathe, sleep, eat poker. Yeah, for a time. For a time, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think the advice about kind of like giving yourself a timeline, um, I think that's actually really, really important. Uh, I am terrified of being just like, I don't know, a grumpy Bellagio 1020 reg in 10 years. Like, yeah. Yeah. That, that might be my worst fear. Um, moving on to some non-poker stuff. Uh, what would you say is your favorite purchase under, let's say, $200 or so um, in the last year that has most positively impacted your life? There's no chance I'm going to come up with an answer to this. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, gosh, honestly, I have no idea. I, I don't like, I don't feel How like I How long have much. you had your whoop for? Do you still wear it? Four years. Yeah. Oh, wow. You've had it It's the forever. stupidest thing ever. It's uh, like, it has Continue. potential. It has potential to be amazing, but like, it's such a ripoff. I paid $30 a month for something that <laughs> an Apple watch could do uh, for a one-time fee. Sure. And the whole reason is because I believe in their tech. Like they can build this out to be something yeah. huge, but also now they have all my data. So they have four year <laughs> backlog, right? And I don't want to recreate that backlog. Yeah. Like I just have that data available to me, but yeah. I don't do anything with it. <laughs> like, it'd be great if I actually yeah. analyzed it. And I yeah. hope at some point their dashboard gets better and like, yeah. you know, I can get to a point of just pulling up a decade's worth of data and just being mm -hmm. like, okay, here's how I'm going to become immortal. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would love to have something, some kind of program or whatever, and also some wearable tech that can just track everything, like everything I ate that day, my mood, how my skin's doing. And I just want to see how all of it like correlates. Yeah. Um, there's Good so much know, noise, though. though. There's yeah. so much noise. There definitely is. And also, I think tech's just going to take, like, at least a few years to get to a point where it can, like, give me useful conclusions from yeah. my data. Um Good to know that I can stop considering getting a whoop because I usually just like look enviously at people who have them and think like, wow, they must be so much more like disciplined and put together than I am. The only thing I use it for truly that it's helpful is mm -hmm. uh, it tracks your your strain and your recovery. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, almost everything is just based off of measuring your, your cardiovascular. So okay. like I could lift my brains out for two hours and it might have my strain at like a four. But I could go, uh, mm, you know, jog a half mile, it. and yeah. it might be it might put my strength like nine, yeah. uh, because you know I get into like zone three or whatever. But yeah. um, what I use it for that's helpful is uh, I it, it does a very good job of accurately measuring how you feel compared to the sleep that you just had. So when my recovery is like low, when I wake up feeling like groggy, I can just open the app and I can see if it correlates. Right, because I I've gotten sure. to the point where I can like trust it now. So if I open the yeah. app and my recovery is in the red, yeah, I'm just like, okay, yeah, I knew it. I felt like shit, and yeah. now this is justifying that or validating sure. that. So uh -huh. I'm gonna like kind of take an easy day. But if I wake up feeling a little bit groggy and I look at my recoveries in the green, I'm just like, oh, okay, I just literally need a few minutes to wake up. That's amazing. That would actually be really helpful. Um, because I wake up and either I'm like just ready to go and excited for my day or I just feel like kind of miserable. But if I could just trust like an app that's telling me like, no, Lynn, like you actually just need a couple of minutes and then you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that would actually just like, yeah. It, it's been beneficial because yeah, there are days where like time. I would feel inclined to power through and mm -hmm. like go play a game because I don't get to play that often and I don't want to miss but I look at my recovery is like a 12. That's amazing. And it's just like, okay, maybe I should just not today. I'm this is 12 on a scale of? 1 to 100. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That actually sounds incredibly useful. Yeah. I'm, I'm still not sold on just like wearing a little black band on my wrist all the time. But Yeah, you're not a fan. 
<laughs> but we're like, we're moving me in that direction. Sure. Um, I think for me, my current favorite purchase that is, let's say around $200 is not my first pair of AirPods, but my second pair of mm. AirPods. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, I think they're this generation, um, the battery and the tech has improved enough where like they don't die so quickly. But I used to just carry a pair of like dead AirPods with me all the time. Right. Um, so now I carry two. Uh, it's helpful. And they're usually not both dead. Um, I know you're like pretty into the whole fitness thing. How does your fitness routine and what are your current goals? Well, my goals just changed because I made a very stupid bet with Landon. Let's hear it. Uh, I bet him that by the start of the World Series, I could dunk a basketball. What? Yeah. Why? Because what he's 6'4", and he's never dunked a basketball. Okay. And I'm six foot and have dunked a basketball. Oh, that's... Okay. Well, just knowing that you've done it before, that's amazing. Yeah, honestly. but I was, you know, 29. Uh, it's, it, You're like 33 now. You'll be fine. I, yeah. Please keep telling people that. <laughs> uh, you lose a lot. For so sure. the last time I dunked, I was 12 years younger and uh, one ACL repair mm -hmm. prior. Oh, wow. Um, but I think I still have a pretty high degree of confidence. By high degree, I mean, I think I'm like 15%, 25% to do this. But we have a wash in place. So he also has to learn to dunk in half the time. Oh, he wow. has till April. So if he doesn't learn, you're free rolling. Correct. No, no it's just a wash. It's Well, I'm free rolling. You're free rolling, right? Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Because um, yeah. you can still dunk a basketball. Yes, but if okay. he dunks, then he's free rolling. Can I ask how much money you guys have on this? 2K. Or? Which is okay. very small, but yeah. like it's, I would have done it for pride. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> I just ran a marathon for ran. pride. Let's not get over our skis here. <laughs> Walk, jog. To be fair, I was like running, if we can consider running where like you have both feet off the ground at mm -hmm. some point in time. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly humbling when Linda shows up, purse in hand, in sandals, Starbucks in hand, and just walks alongside right. me. Yeah. She's not even power walking. Yeah, yeah. When you realize that you're actually just walking with a bounce, yeah. uh, it's it's a bit of a feeling. Yeah. With that said, like, just so many people had like talk shit, including random people on Twitter who just like don't know me at all. It's just like, like, you guys should probably be like, and maybe this goes more specifically to Daniel because he's the one who actually bet. But like, you should generally be scared of betting against someone who's willing to bet on themselves. Like, because that person is just going to have more information like about them. So well, you're at just, a disadvantage. He's just trusting arrogance. And let's <laughs> let's be clear. You do have that youthful arrogance about you. But I That's also true. think he was yeah. greatly, greatly diminishing uh, how tough and resilient you are whenever it comes to like wars of attrition. <laughs> Th these aren't these aren't battles that I personally would want to pick with you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is the same Daniel we got lost on the mountain with. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. And uh, maybe that's a good indicator as to why <laughs> he thought you were soft. Uh, that that yeah. night definitely did not bring out the survivalist that's in true. you. That's true. To be fair, I think I was like relatively relaxed. I just got antsy two hours in. It's like, where's my Twitter and my Instagram? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you guys were all scared of mountain lions. And we called the park rangers and asked if there were mountain lions. And they said there were any. So I was just like, okay, like I can sleep easy. Okay, one. What are you guys scared of? One. Not you guys. <laughs> I was the only one concerned. Everybody else was an idiot. <laughs> Two. Uh, that guy lied to you. That mountain is full of mountain lions. <laughs> Three, uh, it wasn't a fear necessarily. Like it's just understanding that there's a probability, albeit low, that a mountain lion walks up on us, and I don't want to have to figure it out at that point in time. <laughs> we have twelve hours here stuck on a mountaintop yeah. where we're spending the night basically naked. We should probably <laughs> figure out who we're sacrificing. Yeah, like what's going to happen if the worst case presents. That's fair. Yeah, and. To be fair, you guys are all probably faster runners than me. So nah, Fee would have been the first one, to, for <laughs> sure. He's just... He also deserves to get fed to the mountain lions because he, like, him and Daniel, so to kind of paint the picture for you guys, there's five of us. There's three of us trailing behind Daniel and Ryan Fee, um, who are up maybe, like, 
15, 20 meters ahead. And we look kind of lost, but also all the terrain looks the same. So I think one of us, I think I yell up to them and she's like, hey, like, do you think, do you guys think we're going the right direction? And Daniel's, Daniel confidently says yes. And Ryan's like, yeah, 95%. Yeah. <laughs> What in the world? Yeah, I was very positive we were not going the right <laughs> yeah. way. Uh, I was like, we're not on the trail. I think we're on a wash. Yeah. And you yell up and they're like, no, we're like 100% sure. <laughs> and I just look up and I go, there's a ram <laughs> yeah. in front of us. Uh, we're yeah. not We're not going back home tonight. It was cool to see like big horn rams. Um, but I do think that's a really good indicator that we are probably lost. Yeah. Um, Something I love asking you uh, because you're a reader is just like, what have you been reading lately? What are some of your favorite books? Um, I've been reading a lot of Michael Lewis lately. Mm. Uh, so I just finished The Undoing Project, yeah. which I read for the first time. Prior to that, I read Moneyball for the second time, which uh, having a decade between reading it was so great because mm -hmm. I read it when it first came out when I was in college mm -hmm. and I was heavily absorbed into baseball. Yeah, And it was like, at that time... I didn't necessarily think about the strategy of baseball, even though maybe subconsciously I, I did. Yeah. Uh, but it really opened my eyes to a lot of stuff. Then I watched the movie, which was obviously fantastic. And now it's been like 20 years, I guess, since I, I first came in contact. Um, it's such a brilliant book. Yeah. And he's such a fantastic writer. But uh, The Undoing Project was really tremendous, um, kind of getting the backstory on Danny Kahneman and right. uh, yeah. his partner Amos. and. Yeah you know, everything that led to thinking fast and slow. Mm -hmm. um, I just started Sapiens, mm -hmm. which has been on my list for so long. What do you think so far? Uh, it's good. It's, so I listen to books. I, I, okay. I'm i not a reader. Right. Um, it's, it's a little bit technical. It's dry. Yeah. I'm going to say it, yeah. like unpopular opinion, because everyone loves Yuval Noah Harari, who put like. Yeah. Uh, it's it sciencey, so like I'm I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. uh, like I can I can wrap my head around it. Like yeah. I, I like when he goes off into little tangents about how certain species uh, came to be, and like uh, you know talking about like uh, I, I can't remember what the island was, but there was like dwarf species of mm -hmm. of both Homo sapiens and uh, yeah. uh, elephants and, and things like that. Like yeah. that's interesting to me, uh, so I can follow along. But I had the same problem with thinking fast and slow. Yeah, I just could not get through it in my first pass because it was so it. technical and yeah. psychology technicalities yeah. are like so much more uh, yeah. i mean you know you're just not that exposed to it i guess throughout the years For sure. and then on top of that it's like i'm also kind of dipping in and out of those uh sort of like that sort of realm i guess mm -hmm. like you know reading something like the undoing project they they talk a lot about these um like a lot of the studies that that Danny Kahneman utilized throughout his career and things like that. So it's like, mm -hmm. I've already heard a lot of these. Yeah. I've heard the marshmallow test a right. thousand different times, yeah. you know, through a thousand yeah. different books. Absolutely. So I kind of like start to zone out of that stuff. Yeah, no, uh, same. And it's just because I'm like very interested in psychology. Um, but I'm generally a pretty big fan of both Michael Lewis and Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, Gladwell's great. I find them to be good writers. They're engaging. They're good at telling a story. Yeah. Um, uh, it's not an accident that all of Michael yeah. Lewis's books turn into movies. Yeah. And yeah, Gladwell is probably one of the most fantastic storytellers. Have you ever listened to his podcast? No, not not long. I actually portions. think he's he's more impressive of a storyteller vocally mm. than he is the way that he writes. Okay. He just speaks with like such a yeah. such a fervor and and his inflections are so great and yeah. he has that soft spoken voice that like you're just kind of like leaning in and <laughs> latching on a little bit. Yeah. Uh, he he's really a riveting person yeah. to listen to. Um did you ever get around to reading Green Lights, Matthew McConaughey, or listening? I recommended it to you. Did you? <laughs> around recommending it to everyone. He's a fantastic. What, a, what an amazing I narrator. I know. I would never read that book. I. It would be garbage. So I think now that I know that you are the one that recommended to me, when you did, I think I was a third of the way through the book and I just stopped, bought the Audible version and started listening. And yeah. It makes a world of a difference. He's amazing. Um, I've yeah. converted other people who've also like already started the book to listening literally every well. inspirational book ever written should be read by matthew mcconaughey <laughs> like he can talk about the driest thing and just yeah. put a like go get him champ at the end and i'm just like yeah i am gonna tie my shoes today <laughs> i mean to be fair like 
two other incredible orators are Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Um, their books are also amazing if you guys are looking for audiobook recommendations. Um, but speaking of reading, you also write. Uh, and I don't know, like, mm. how often you promote or link your blog or... Almost never. It's been yeah. dead for a long time. Um, I've always been incredibly impressed by just, like, how much you open up through your blog posts. It seems like you, like, really kind of, like, reach deep down in there um, and show, like, a vulnerable side. Has that been, like, relatively easy for you do you find it therapeutic what got you started writing um it's a good question i i think i first well i wrote a lot in high school but like forcefully mm-hmm. like i was just in classes that required it yeah uh, so like we didn't have ap or anything sure. like that we small school um so the way that they kind of penned the 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 more intelligent kids into classes was to create like honors Mm, so we had like honors english and and things of that nature and we were just tasked with more of this stuff (laughs) right so i did a lot of creative writing in those classes and i i just always got good marks um Mm -hmm. and found it to be easy yeah not necessarily fun Mm because at 17 i wanted to play sports and talk to girls not write about my feelings but (laughs) um i think as i started to pursue poker more and you know it's such a negative feedback loop type of game. Yeah. Uh, it needed an outlet. And it was also like fascinating because when I was coming up, you had to be a trailblazer. Nobody was there to hold right. your hand. Like, right. you know, for, for your generation, all of the people who are willing to offer advice and coaching and training and things of that nature, yeah. they're very accessible. For me, the, the next generation above was like Negranu, Helmuth, Ivy. Right. Like, they didn't want anything to do with us. They were just like, <laughs> get off, get out of here. Like they were celebrities. And Ivy superstars. wasn't handholding you through. Uh... Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, he's still. Yeah. Get away from me, kid. Um, <laughs> so you know, we really had to figure things out on our own, and like I like that challenge. I like that aspect. I like mm-hmm. coming up with new ideas and being innovative mm-hmm. uh, and even contrarian to some some degrees. Mm-hmm. And I felt the best way to flesh that out was like to explain myself. Mm-hmm. Um. So I wrote a lot about like poker and trips and Mm -hmm. things. It's all lost now. Uh, I was posting to like a forum that's dead, but um, I then stopped for a long period of time, Mm -hmm. probably for like four or five years until uh, 2015 when I was in the biggest downswing of my life. Uh, I was on like a 5 million downswing. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, my mother OD'd and then my grandmother was terminal uh, shortly thereafter. So within like a six month span, Uh, maybe even less, maybe like a five month span. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mom passed and then my grandma passed. And uh, yeah, it's it's easy to write something readable when you are incredibly emotionally heightened. Um, So I don't know why I drew, honestly, I think I was drawn to it because I just thought I could do something good, if that makes sense. I know it's more selfish than that. Mm-hmm. Like the selfish thought was, uh, I I know that I'm capable of writing something well mm-hmm. when I feel this way, mm. and selfishly I want yeah. I want the accolades for that. Sure. Um, but I think like looking back beyond that, it was kind of I, I'm not very open when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like I'm not mm-hmm. the type of person who accepts help very easily. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I am in a heightened emotional state, very yeah. few people are going to know it. Mm-hmm. So I think that was just kind of my way of mm. uh, venting yeah. without actually having to lean on yeah. another person. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. Um, and I'm I'm sorry to kind of hear about how tough like that period of your life was. Um, and I also really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and on a lighter note, I find that I also do like most of my writing, uh, albeit it is like journaling rather than posting it publicly, um, when I am in heightened emotional states or as I would call it, post breakup. Sure. Um, So if I go through and I read like journals from past years, it is just the most depressing thing ever. Yeah. (laughs) Because when things are going well, I'm not venting to a page. I'm just living life. Yeah. It's when times suck that like... And I'm doing most of my writing. Yeah, I, I think that's true too. Uh, I've had very few breakups, so um, that was never, I guess, 
Well, that, I, sh- I shouldn't say never yeah. because like I do the same thing. Like mm-hmm. I've had very few breakups, but the the yeah. two or three that have been incredibly impactful to me, it's like, yeah, I have an entire journal on it. Right. Um, but that stuff is less well put together, yeah. I think. On a happier note, what would you say is your single proudest moment? In life? In life. <laughs> Although if like a poker one comes more readily no, to mind. It's definitely not going to be poker. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, for sure. It's a... I meant within the context of poker, but yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely prefer you answer it pertaining to life. Um, it's, it, it's an interesting question because I think younger me was very uh, insecure about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So most of the things I pr- pursued yeah. were to prove to myself or others that mm-hmm. I could do something that I didn't think I could. So younger me, it for sure would have been playing college baseball. Yeah. Uh, I, I overachieved. Like my talent definitely did not allow mm-hmm. me to get there. Yeah. I had like just enough talent coupled with, you know, an insane work ethic yeah. and a lot of luck yeah. that let me break that. But uh, I think older me kind of understands or at least learned to understand that pride is uh, a negative attribute, not, mm-hmm. not so much yeah. one to... To really like lean on so much, um, but I guess one of the most meaningful things would have been uh, when my grandmother was diagnosed terminal. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, uh, it easily could have been a rock bottom moment where everything was trending poorly. Sure. I'm on a fifty buy in downswing mm-hmm. in this big game, and I think that like I could be cut any day now. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother just finally lost her battle with drugs and. And passed away and, you know, I didn't exactly handle that very eloquently. Uh, We didn't even have a funeral for her. It was just kind of an afterthought, so to speak, or almost uh, was treated as a relief. So there was all this negative momentum building. Mm -hmm. And then immediately thereafter, I find out my grandmother's terminal. But she was probably one of the most impactful people in my life growing up, her and my grandfather. Um, And when he passed of cancer 10 years prior... He's very much like, I understand where I get it from. He just protected everybody. Mm-hmm. He, he kept everything to himself. He didn't let anybody know how bad it was. I was in college mm-hmm. and legitimately, even though I knew that he had been diagnosed, uh, he was diagnosed my senior year and he passed my uh, sophomore year. Uh, so for he was like diagnosed which year? Senior year of high school, sorry. Okay, got it. And uh, sophomore year uh, of college. Yeah, so like, it was like a three-year battle, right? right? But the entire time, I had no idea Mm -hmm. that he was like worse than stage one. Like I thought he was just like, you know, barely sick. And then we would see him like go through a little bit of chemo here and there. Mm -hmm. And uh, his physical state was deteriorating a little bit. It's like, okay, maybe it's advancing. But like in my head, like this was either beatable or he had like, you know, 10 years ahead of him or something like that. So um, when he ultimately passed, I didn't even get a chance to see him until he was basically in a in a morphine coma because he was holding it for like i spoke to him on the phone two days prior he's in the hospital on his deathbed saying like yeah i just have pneumonia i'm gonna be out of here in a little while you have midterms don't worry about it you know and do you think there's a chance that he generally felt that way genuinely felt that way or do you think that was more just like a no that was definitely him okay, just like got it. knowing that trying to relieve like any yeah we were we were very close yeah. and i don't think he wanted to put me through seeing him yeah. uh in that way mm-hmm. Which is a little bit selfish, but also I, I know it was coming from a good place. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So when it came to my grandmother and now I'm an adult mm-hmm. and, you know, she doesn't have him any longer sure. to lean on. And she's just been this rock in my life for the better part of three decades. Mm-hmm. I just dropped everything. It was like, yeah. don't care about this downswing. Don't care about yeah. anything. Went home, yeah. uh, immediately started like doing whatever research I could for yeah. uh, for like pain relief and um, crazy enough, she had u- she had like stage four uterine cancer. Uh, Gosh. was diagnosed as as terminal when I got home. It was like I don't know mid July or so, mm-hmm. and they gave her like four to six weeks. Yeah, and they were like sending hospice and already giving me like you know instructions for morphine, like how to basically mm-hmm. uh, comatose her and like let her mm-hmm. go. And she's she was she had like never taken a drug or anything like that. And she was like, I really don't want this. Yeah. I was like, okay, like I'll look into yeah. alternative methods. Yeah. And uh, ironically, um, I was able to get her on like a CBD THC routine. Yeah. She never took 
a single drop of morphine Gosh, between great. like there and her death. It was yeah. wild. And like, you know, yeah. she was mostly pain free. Um, yeah. That three and a half months mm -hmm. or so, even though it came with like changing shitty diapers sure. and, yeah. you know, just doing all the hard stuff, I wouldn't mm -hmm. trade that for the yeah. world. Like if I had missed a single second of that, I would be so, so regretful. Um, I, I can't explain like what a powerful thing it is mm -hmm. to care for somebody who cared for you like that. Yeah. Um, and I can't imagine what it would have been like for her if mm -hmm. she had to just rely on hospice care. Yeah. Because they suck. Also, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, if, if she like doesn't want morphine, mm -hmm. um, I, I highly doubt whoever's working at the hospice is going to like put in the effort that you did right. to help her find alternatives. Not even that. Like you want to talk about your most vulnerable state. Like mm -hmm. you're literally dying. Gosh, yeah. You know, yeah. and you're bedridden and you're just yeah. lying there and you're reliant upon everything. Yeah. So it's like you're you're almost infantilized. Yeah. In, 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 yeah. You're an I infant again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, you're basically reduced to becoming an Gosh, infant all over again yeah. and requiring 20, requiring 24 hour care. Yeah. And, you know, imagine that coming from a non loved one yeah. where it's a job. Do you have a will? Uh, no, I should. So I I, should. I've been taking this class um, called Befriending Death because mm -hmm. I have friends at a variety of ages. And also, like, I have two grandmothers that are either in their 90s or nearing um, 90. So, in this class, like, uh, in the very first session, like, we had to write our own obituary. And that had, like, a really cool way of, like, putting life in perspective. Yeah. Because when I pass, assuming I pass and medical technology does not um, mm. go to the moon, uh, like, one day I want to be known as a thoughtful and loving mother. Like, poker, like, poker would at best be like a short stint sure, um, or maybe like half a sentence. Uh, but something we've talked a lot about is just like passing like with dignity as well as like how you want to be treated in the final like months, weeks, days of your life, as mm -hmm. well as like who is then going to help you execute on your wishes when you might like no longer have that capability. Yeah. Um, I very foolishly responded with my parents before realizing that it is probably somewhat unlikely that they will be around sure. when I'm passing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but I mean, if you're answering for current day. Yeah. That, well, that's that's what I was doing. And then I quickly like revised my answer because. To some magical made up person. No. Um, <laughs> I actually, I, I, I would probably rely on my siblings and then my best friend, Teresa. Mm. So. Uh, I definitely have people in mind in terms of like who I would want to help like execute my wishes. Yeah, yeah. Um, before I let you go, what is one thing you're looking forward to in the near future? Uh, snowboarding season. Yeah. I have you to thank for that. <laughs> um, do you have any trips planned? Where um, are you most excited to snowboard? I really want to go to Banff. Uh, oh gosh, me too. I haven't been. Yeah. The borders were closed the last couple of years. Uh, Banff and Japan are both like on the short list. Mm -hmm. uh, Banff's like, a lot. It's a lot easier to make it to Banff than, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> than yeah. to Japan. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I really wanted to try to go this year. The problem is, is that like I picked it up way too late in life, and I don't have any. I shouldn't say any, but I don't have many friends who are also interested in it. So it makes these trips like difficult and expensive and annoying. And I'm a tag along, you know. Yeah. Um... So, yeah, like, obviously, the fact that it's a little bit more expensive, that can be annoying. Like, it's nice to have, like, people to split costs with. Yeah. But uh, are you someone where you're, like, willing to kind of, like, be the person in charge where you make all the decisions? Like, we're going on these dates. We're staying here, et cetera. Yeah, I'm happy to, I guess. But you just need to round up people. Well, <laughs> the, the problem is, is, like, when I make those decisions, yeah, uh, it ends up just, like, I take on more of a burden than I should. What do you mean? Well, like I'll make decisions based off of what's reasonable to me. Yeah. And then just accept that if that's like financially unreasonable to sure. somebody else or time wise unreasonable to somebody else, yeah. then I'll just like bend or cover mm -hmm. in some way, shape or form for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just, it makes it messier, I think. I see what you mean. Yeah. 
I definitely have friends where like they're good at just making like really utilitarian decisions, but then also like reporting back to everyone being like, hey, like you owe me this much. Yeah. Um, whereas for me, it's just like maybe it's also like a slightly entitled or privileged thing from my end. But I both want to be comfortable and I want the people around me to be as comfortable as possible. And if that means like people kind of just pitch in what they can and then like I eat the rest of the class, like to me, that's just not the no, it's not the worst. That, that's honestly fine. Yeah. Once in a while, it's just you you can't repeat it. It's difficult to do that yes. six or seven times a season. Yeah, that is true. And I greatly want to be surrounded by people when I go on these trips. Like my nephew yeah. and I went uh, just by ourselves to Park mm -hmm. City twice last year, sure. and it's it, it was fine. Yeah. But it was a different experience. Yeah, large and, groups can be fun. Yeah, and also like lodging and stuff like that when it's just two is very annoying. Um, cause you end up doing like the hotel instead of a house. Yeah. Like for me anyway, it's very inconvenient to me. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I, I like space now. Yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. nice to be in a house. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that Banff is probably on the short yeah. list. Well, I hope you make it happen. Me too. Um, yeah, I, I just saw some pictures of Lake Louise, uh, in Banff recently. I, I said no to an invite to spend a couple of days there and I'm. Already regretting it. It's too it. soon. Well, it's too soon for snowboarding, but it's not too soon to just like enjoy winter. Um, yeah. There's like a, a TikTok going around of Lake Louise uh, with people ice skating on it. And gosh. the water is like so, so pure yeah. that you can see through the ice. That's incredible. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. I might have to fly up there with some ice skates. Mm. Um, but yeah, so you are playing at Live at the Bike today and tomorrow? Yep. Okay. Well, good luck there. And thank you so much for doing this with me, for being on my podcast. Um, I don't know what order I'm going to be releasing episodes in, but this is the first one I'm filming. So thank you so much for being here. Anytime. And good luck today and tomorrow. Thanks.